even if we know and we generate data of a bunch of fake studies, 100, 1,000, whatever the number is, and we know for a fact there is an effect that is present, you are going to get studies that show wildly different outcomes purely due to sampling variants. So a particular point you made is that once you do three or four sets for an exercise, you've more or less maximized the muscle protein synthetic response, or just put simply the hypertrophic benefit you're going to get from that exercise. And to some degree, that isn't necessarily what we see in the volume research. So as someone that maybe values the outcome oriented data a little bit more, I would say, okay, I agree just like theoretically that seems to make sense. Like, that's just intuitive that after you train an exercise really hard, at some point it stops being effective. But then if you value outcome-oriented research quite a bit, you might say, man, we have to really question that, right? We need, we, need to, we need to rethink that. But what you're saying is, man, measuring hypertrophy is tough. I know you're not like really big in the swelling game, but maybe something like swelling is contributing here. And I just have enough conviction using logic or mechanistic rationale and experience and experience that I'm going to operate as if after I do my third or fourth set on an exercise that I'm probably not going to benefit from additional additional sets. Is that pretty fair? And until there's direct evidence against the contrary, maybe that's a decent position. That's kind of how I've interpreted it. Yeah, I I think that's fair. Um I, I also would say it's it's not that I'm out not outcome driven. It's a I'm very critical of all the papers I read, like the Brigado paper that used a mode ultrasound. Like, I don't think you can measure muscle growth in a mode ultrasound. Um, some of these papers use circumference. Some of these papers um, just don't see growth. And when you toss all that in there and y you interpret it independent of the analysis, it's like, how compelling is any of this literature as a whole? And that's how I kind of always approach it. I, I think y'all's paper is great. Like, I, I think it's gonna lead to a lot of good discussion and a lot of good research. So I think it's a step in the right direction, but I still have to read every paper and I have to find out what every paper said to, I, have, I need that layer to make my decision, right? Um, a good example is that rest period meta that came out, right? Do y'all remember the, the rest period um, singer, singer at all? Yep. So this is one of those examples of the meta-analysis is the top tier piece of evidence that we can use to make a conclusion, but they have nine studies in, included in that meta-analysis. Two of those are low load training. Well, I think it's pretty well demonstrated that you can use short rest with low load training. Um, one of those studies, the Vela Nueva or something like that, used rest periods manipulated during a strength mesocycle. And the group that had short rest actually saw some growth. The group that had long rest didn't. So that's three studies that independently would tell a very different story than the meta-analysis. So that leaves six papers. Two of the papers used incremental rest periods where it decreased 15 seconds every week. It started at 30 seconds. Or ended at 30 seconds. Yeah, it, was like, it was like 120 to start with, something like that. And it was treated as an average of 80. Well, I think 80 would be sufficient all of the time, where in, in reality, they probably trained with too short a rest for four weeks and plenty of rest for the other four weeks. So that meta-analysis draws a conclusion, but independently, there's an explanation for each study for why they saw what they saw. And I, I, I think you need both. Uh, but I, I, that particular meta, I don't think is necessarily helpful. I think there's just too much variability in the studies that were included. But in general, I think I think you need both. And with the outcomes on volume, I just I don't find them to be consistent. And you know, you find a study that had high volume but saw no growth. I haven't read it in a while, but I think the Cody Hahn paper, not the sarcoplasmic sub-analysis, but the original analysis was pretty high volume. It didn't see growth. The our our Mithingham study, I, I think, was no growth. Yeah, I'm, I apologize to the authors if they if they listen. Yeah. Um, but it's I think it's a bit more of a toss-up, at least from from my perspective. And then the studies that do, right, then you have to look closely. And, and sometimes it's just difficult for me to reconcile. Um, let me give you an example. And, and this, is, this is just how I like to break down the research. The, um, I'm pulling up so I don't mess it up here. The, the Radiali paper, um, one set, three set, five sets. What's interesting to me is that the extensors, the triceps, grew 0 0.02 for the three set group over six months, but 0.8 in the five sets. So you're telling me they're going from three to five sets per session, went from no growth to 0.8 in the triceps. Like, I think everyone would agree that you're getting most of the stimulus from probably the first three sets, maybe a little bit additional from the other two. 
So I'm more interested, okay, what happened here? Why did three lead to nothing and five led to amazing growth? I mean, that's very, very impressive growth. Um, and that one, I had to digitize it because I don't yeah, think you you provided the raw values. Lost, yeah. But like, there's so many instances where like, when you dive deep into the data, just study by study, it's like, okay, well, that to me is not compelling on its own. And, and to be fair, yeah, when you combine them together, it, I, I completely understand, Josh, your perspective and why you would hold it. And, mm-hmm. and I think you could be right. But I can't get over these little things that bug me. Yeah. Like, that bugs me. I, 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 let me just say something really quick. I know you're going to have some things to say here because like a, a few times throughout the podcast, you've mentioned just, like some outlier outcomes or just like, Okay, obviously, on average, going from three sets to five sets per exercise is not going to go from no growth to like super robust growth. I'll I'll let Zach take that because I think we we might view that through a slightly different lens. But but I just want to be clear for the record, like I I have these similar thoughts as you. Probably where I'm a little bit different is like again, I come back to like what the alternative is. I I, I have my my questions about swelling or edema and the the time course. I have my questions about what is actually required to maintain muscle mass. I have my questions about natural limits and training sustainability. I have my own personal experience about some aches and pains that still kind of linger and pop up here uh, every now and again because of periods where I just trained with way too high of volumes. So, like, um, I guess I just want to be clear for the record. I'm not like a – this isn't high volume versus low volume. And, and, and uh, a funny thing, and you alluded to this a bit before, is that when we were on Steve Hall's podcast at the very end, Steve was like, all right. I'm twisting your arm. What is the uh, what are your recommended volumes? And Sam's were a little bit higher than mine. Um, so I just want to be clear for the record. This isn't really a high versus low volume. I think this is fruitful in terms of like how do we it's like epistemology? Epistemology, exactly. Yeah. So with that, I'll, I'll let you take it, Zach. Yeah, Sam. The the interesting thing that I find. So you know, obviously, I come at this from a little bit more like a a, a stats perspective is kind of the way that I tend to think about these things. And the interesting thing that I hear you say are basically the statistical assumptions that go into meta-analysis just formalized a little bit more. So essentially, the few things you brought up is you have individual studies that have variant outcomes, some of which that seem, frankly, bizarre when you look at them in isolation. You have an overall body of studies that, you know, probably lean in a little bit of a overall direction, but you also have some studies that seem to go away from that direction. And ultimately, the, the, the thing that's comforting to me and why I view these types of projects when they're sufficiently powered, as you said, sometimes when you have only a couple studies that meet the relevant criteria, it's not particularly helpful. But, you know, in our five hour snooze fest podcast, we kind of talked about a few of these things. But when we do these kinds of projects, it's able to take into account all those exact same issues that you just mentioned. So the first thing that I think is so hard for people to understand, and I'm not saying you're saying this, Sam, but just for a listener's perspective, even if we know and we generate data of a bunch of fake studies, 100, 1,000, whatever the number is, and we know for a fact there is an effect that is present, you are going to get studies that show wildly different outcomes purely due to sampling variants. Particularly, you layer on slow sample research or small end studies like we often deal with, that problem is going to get 100 times worse. And this is why just the more that I've done this and the more experience that we've gotten, it really does come down to saying an individual study is nothing more than a drop in a bucket. And I know a lot of people say that, but I think if things were presented in slightly different ways, which to be fair, Sam's studies always have a control group, which I think is very, very important, which is essentially what I'm what I'm talking about is, you know, our research, often we have like a region that is compatible with measurement error. And almost never is the study, is the difference between conditions neatly within that, neatly outside of that, or some paints a very clear picture because the effects are extremely consistent or extremely large. That pretty much never happens, which basically is telling you the effects are ambiguous. We can't interpret these in isolation. And that's where these types of projects that directly model that sampling variance that we would expect across an entire body of literature, even if they had all the same effect, basically is going to take all those individual studies that have very, very um, variant outcomes that are on the, the outside of that normal distribution of effects that we would expect, those get pulled in back to, towards the population mean. And each one of those studies, just like you do when you go and read all of them individually, you have this cloud in your brain of, this is what I would expect, generally speaking, this one's weird. That's exactly what a model does in knowing all of these other data points exist and pulls everything back towards a story that actually is cohesive with the literature at large. 